This is a light bulb. It's simple. It turns on, it turns off, and it illuminates the room, sure. But what else does it do? Take a look at my face. Don't be enamored by the cuteness, but at how the light bounces off my glasses, dances across my skin, and leaves some parts in the shadows. It's not just light, it's geometry, physics, math, all conspiring to create what we call reality. Now, imagine you're a game designer trying to recreate all of this. Every reflection, every shadow, every subtle glow. But here's the thing, you have to calculate all of this in real time, 60 times per second or more. That's where ray tracing comes in. It's not just technology, it's sorcery. Or well, math, but for me, it's one of the same thing. Let's shed some light on how all of this works. Ray tracing started with a deceptively simple idea. What happens to light? In 1968, a guy named Arthur Apple introduced ray casting, a method to calculate what surfaces in a scene are visible to the camera. This technique only focuses on what's in front of it and not where the light bounces to. Fast forward to 1979, Turner Whitted decided light needed personality. He added a few more variables to track. He wanted to know what happens after the light bounces. Reflections, refractions, shadows, it all became possible. Suddenly, light wasn't just hitting things, it was telling a story. Recursive ray tracing was born. This technique could simulate glass bending light, water scattering it, and mirror reflecting it. It was revolutionary, but there was one massive problem to be used in games, speed. Back then, computers were slower than anyone trying to explain NFTs to Grand Graham at a family dinner. Rendering a single frame with ray tracing could take hours, if not days. So it wasn't practical for games just yet, but is it useful for anyone else? Heck yeah it is, those gals and pals in the film business. Movies and animation studios saw ray tracing and said, yeah, we'll take two. In 1989, James Cameron's The Abyss used ray tracing for its iconic reflective water pseudopod. But here's the kicker, rendering 75 seconds of footage took seven months. For context, that is more than three. Pixar first used ray tracing in A Bug's Life to create reflections on a glass bottle. Super neat. But again, these frames were rendered on render farms, full of computers sweating over every photon. Games don't have the luxury. They needed more localized oomph. While Hollywood was showing off, gaming had to get creative. Before ray tracing became the hot shot of gaming, developers had to rely on some clever tricks to make virtual worlds look convincing. Let's be clear, they were master strokes of optimization designed to deliver decent visuals without setting your GPU on fire. First up, Fong and its shinier cousin, Blind Fong, were used to fake how light spread and create highlights on surfaces. The first 3D gaming hardware capable of Fong shading was Sega's Hikaru Arcade system in 1999. There was also baked lighting. Developers pre-computed all of the lights, shadows, and global illumination and literally bake them into the game's textures. To make things feel more grounded, games added Screen Space Ambient Occlusion, or SSAO. This simulated how ambient light gets blocked in tight spaces, like the corners of a room. Shadows can bleed though, and the results are still a few steps from reality. Reflections were another big challenge. Developers couldn't just calculate light bouncing around in real time, so they had to come up with cube maps. These are essentially static images mapped onto a cube to create the illusion of reflections. It worked great until the reflections didn't match reality. That shiny car, it reflected the sunny day while you were driving through a th sun thunderstorm. SSR, Screen Space Reflections, tried to improve things by using the screen's existing data to generate reflections. It's like looking into a puddle that only remembers what's directly in front of it. Move the camera and the puddle has a memory lapse. For more accurate reflections on flat surfaces like water, games also used planar reflections. This involves rendering the scene twice, from the object's perspective and your own. The result? Stunning. The downside? Your GPU might start questioning your life choices. Onto some shadows, those moody, atmospheric elements that we all take for granted. Early games used shadow maps, which are like snapshots taken from the light's perspective. The game projects those onto the scene to create shadows. Simple, right? But when the resolution is low, those shadows can look jagged. They're like made of Lego bricks. To fix this, developers introduced cascading shadow maps, CSM. They divided the shadow maps into sections. 
dedicating more detail to areas closer to the camera. And finally, we get some well-deserved visual drama, volumetric lighting, or god rays. Those are simulated beams of lights scattered through the fog and the forest, creating those epic cinematic looks. Yeah, it's not the most physically accurate, but they look freaking amazing. These techniques, fog shading, baked lighting, cube maps, were decades of evolution. Games needed to run on hardware that would burst into flames if you even thought about ray tracing. But as clever as they were, they all had their limitations. Shadows didn't follow moving objects, reflections weren't seen accurate, and dynamic lighting were more like dynamic-ish. The dream was always real time, but the hardware just wasn't there yet. That is until 2018, when Nvidia said, what if we give your GPU its own math wizard? For the first time, real time ray tracing became possible. But how? Enter RT cores, a dedicated hardware built specifically for ray tracing calculations. Think of them as little math magicians inside of your GPU, each tracing the path of light at lightning speed. The result, puddles that reflected explosions, glass that actually looked like glass, and shadows that didn't feel like they could cut a slice of bread. But there's always a catch. This time, back again, it's frame rate. Turning on ray tracing was like asking your GPU to sprint a marathon while juggling flaming swords. It worked, but at what cost? That's where DLSS came in, and I did not write down what it stands for. It is Deep Learning Super Sampling. NVIDIA's AI-powered upscaling renders games at lower resolution and then uses machine learning to make them look better. It's like taking a blurry photo and magically sharpening it. With DLSS, games like Cyberpunk 2077 or Minecraft RTX went from poopy frame rates to visual masterpieces. The real-time ray tracing is finally here. But gaming isn't the only place ray tracing shines. In robotics, it's used to simulate real-world lighting so self-driving cars can learn how to navigate. In Hollywood, virtual production is the new frontier. LED walls with real-time ray trace environments replace green screens, letting directors tweak lighting and reflections on the fly. Filmmakers are basically stepping into a fully immersive world in real time. Ray tracing isn't just about making games look good, it's about recreating the magic of light itself. From Hollywood blockbusters to self-driving cars, it's transforming how we see and interact with the digital world. So the next time you see a shiny puddle in a game, take a moment. It's not just a reflection, it's decades of innovation compressed into a single frame. Bye.